Hello. In this video, we will look at earthworms. The information provided here is also in the Invertebrates 2 lab exercise. I will show you the models, dissected specimens, and microscope slides that may be included on the upcoming lab practical, and point out the structures that you should be familiar with. But first, a little taxonomy. Earthworms are segmented worms, and therefore are included in the phylum Annelida. This phylum includes polychaete worms and leeches as well as earthworms. Oligochaeta is the class of Annelida that includes earthworms. The name refers to the fact that there are only a few chaetae, or bristles, on each body segment. Let's begin our tour by looking at the model of the earthworm that is available to you in the laboratory. This view shows organs and structures found in the anterior end of the worm. The green tube running down the middle of the model represents the digestive system. Earthworms have a complete digestive system, with a mouth at one end and an anus at the other. This is more efficient than a gastrovascular cavity with its single opening. The mouth is not visible in this view, so the first structure is the buccal cavity. This is simply a tube connecting the opening of the mouth with the next structure, the pharynx. The pharynx is a muscular tube that can expand to draw food into its interior space, much like you use your mouth to suck in a milkshake. Food is transported through the esophagus, by means of muscular contractions, to the crop. The crop serves as a temporary storage area until the food is allowed a little at a time into the gizzard. The gizzard has a thick muscular wall that contracts to grind the food into smaller particles. This works well since earthworms always take in a lot of sand and dirt with their food. You could regard this process as mechanical digestion, a task you accomplish with your teeth. Once the gizzard has completed its task, the food is passed into the intestine where chemical digestion and absorption occur. Several other structures are visible in this view. At the anterior end of the earthworm, sitting atop the digestive tube, are a pair of suprapharyngeal ganglia. A ganglion is a mass of nerve cell bodies and fibers. The suprapharyngeal ganglia are the earthworm's brain, such as it is, Next, we have the dorsal blood vessel, sitting atop the digestive tube. This vessel carries blood towards the heart, as we will discuss shortly. The blue tube-like structures on the inside wall of the model represent metanephridia. Your lab manual refers to these simply as nephridia. These carry out excretory functions in the earthworm. There are two metanephridia per body segment, with a few exceptions. Now let's take a closer look at the middle part of the model. To orient you, this part of the green tube is the esophagus, this is the crop, and this is the dorsal blood vessel. There are five pairs of hearts in an earthworm, as you can observe here. Each is really just a lateral blood vessel with an especially thick muscular wall. By rhythmic muscular contractions, the hearts pump blood from the dorsal blood vessel to the ventral blood vessel, which is out of sight beneath the digestive tube. Now is probably a good time to point out that earthworms have a closed circulatory system. This means that the circulatory fluid, which we can call blood, remains within vessels at all times. Some animals, notably insects, have an open circulatory system in which the circulatory fluid is sometimes within vessels but also travels through the spaces surrounding the internal organs. Another important fact about earthworms is that they are hermaphrodites. This means, as you probably know, that individuals possess both male and female reproductive systems. In earthworms, both systems function simultaneously, but not, as many believe, to allow for self-fertilization. The six large brown structures are seminal vesicles, part of the male reproductive system. If you remove the digestive tube from the model in the laboratory, 
you can see that these are really just lobes of a single structure. Sperm are produced by a pair of testes that are not visible in this view, and then the sperm are stored in the seminal vesicles until copulation. The four seminal receptacles are part of the female reproductive system. During copulation, the earthworm receives sperm from the other worm, which is stored in the seminal receptacles. Fertilization in earthworms is external. Once copulation is complete, the earthworm will secrete a mucus sheath that covers the genital openings. The worm then releases its own eggs and the sperm that it received from the other worm into this mucus sheath. Now let's look at a prepared earthworm dissection, several of which are available to you in the laboratory. At the top, these two small white structures are the suprapharyngeal ganglia. The label pointer is a bit out of place. The same is true for the heart's label. These red structures here are the hearts. The small white structures on the right are the seminal receptacles, and these larger, somewhat darker structures are the seminal vesicles. The pharynx is clearly visible, but the esophagus is mostly obscured by the hearts and the reproductive organs. The gizzard and the intestine are labeled, but for some reason the crop was left out. So, let's remedy that situation. Now let's look at the model again from a different perspective. Notice once again the metanephridia. As I said before, there are two in each body segment. Body segments are called somites. These segments are not merely lines on the body surface. The coelom is separated into compartments by septa. These thin membranes separate the coelom into watertight compartments. We will discuss the significance of this in a moment, but first, notice the clitellum. This structure is what secretes the mucus needed for copulation and subsequent formation of the cocoon, where fertilization and embryonic development take place. Here is a closer view of the model, showing the septa that separate the coelom into water-filled compartments. Since liquids don't compress much, these compartments impart a degree of rigidity to the worm's body, so much so that the system is referred to as a hydrostatic skeleton. And like a skeleton made of bone or chitin, this hydrostatic skeleton works with the muscles to make movement possible. There are two layers of muscle in the body wall. Just under the epidermis is a layer of muscle in which the fibers go around the diameter of the body. This is referred to as circular muscle. And underneath that layer is a second muscle layer in which the fibers run lengthwise, so it is called longitudinal muscle. Contracting the circular muscles squeezes the liquid in the somites, forcing the body to grow longer. The worm then uses its chitae to anchor its anterior end to the substrate. Relaxing the circular muscles and contracting the longitudinal muscles shortens the body again, which pulls the posterior end forward. Here is a view of the earthworm model that many students miss. It is the posterior end, and it constitutes a cross-section of the worm at the level of the intestine. There are a number of structures that you should recognize here. The outer layer of the earthworm is the cuticle, a non-cellular substance secreted by the epidermis. You can't, really can't distinguish the two in this model. Earthworms carry out gas exchange through their body surface, so the layer must be thin and remain moist. Beneath the epidermis is the circular muscle layer, and beneath that layer is the longitudinal muscle. You can also see in this view the chitae or bristles. These are called setae in your lab manual. One of the questions in the lab manual refers to the number of chitae found in one somite. This view can help you to answer that question. The liquid-filled cavity in the worm is, of course, the coelom. A septum separates this compartment from the next compartment, 
so the coelom consists of a large number of individual compartments. The blue structures are the two metanephridia. Their position illustrates the fact that the metanephridia float within the coelomic fluid and do not adhere to the inner body wall, as they appear to in the rest of the model. Near the top is the dorsal blood vessel. The green structure is the intestine. Here you can see the lumen of the intestine, the space where food is located. Notice that the intestine is not simply a hollow tube. There is a fold of tissue hanging down from the top. This is the tiflosol. It is thought that this serves to increase the surface area for absorbing nutrients. Beneath the intestine is the ventral blood vessel. This vessel carries blood away from the hearts, and therefore is equivalent to an artery in vertebrates. The dorsal blood vessel takes blood back to the hearts and is equivalent to a vein. Beneath the ventral blood vessel is the nerve cord. Like most invertebrates that have a central nervous system, the nerve cord in annelids is located in the ventral part of the body. As we will see in the Invertebrates 3 lab exercise, chordates are the only major phylum with a dorsally located nerve cord. Carefully note the location of the structures in this cross-sectional view of the model. Now, compare it to this microscope slide of a cross-section of a real earthworm. This slide is available to you in the laboratory. All the same parts are here and in the same relative positions. The outer layer consists of the cuticle and epidermis. Just beneath that is the circular muscle layer. Here is the longitudinal muscle layer. You can't see any chitae in this model, but you can see in some locations where they would be if they were in this particular view. The white space, of course, is the coelom. And here is one of the two metanephridia in this section. The one on the right is not quite so clearly indicated. At the top is the dorsal blood vessel. This is the intestine with its lumen. And of course, this is the tiflosol. Beneath the intestine, we have the ventral blood vessel. And this structure is the ventral nerve cord. Identifying the major parts in both the model and the microscope slide will make it much easier for you to identify them during the laboratory practical. Despite the differences in appearance, this is also a microscope cross-section of an earthworm. You can find all the same structures as in the previous specimen. The epidermis with its cuticle, circular muscle, longitudinal muscle, Coelom, metanephridium, dorsal blood vessel, intestine, you can all even see some food in the intestine here, the tiflosol. Down here is the ventral blood vessel and the nerve cord. It's always a good idea to look at two or more slides when studying, since you don't know which one will be used on the lab practical. So, there you have it, a brief survey of the models, specimens, and slides of the earthworm, available to you in the laboratory, and the structures and functions that you should learn for the lab practical.